Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to Earth Echoes Snack Sized Science. We're so excited to have so many of you joining us out there again today. My name is Casey, and we're here to talk about adaptations today. So I just want to start with a little disclaimer. There are a lot of people online these days. So if we do experience any technical issues, any delays, please just hang tight and be patient. There are a lot of people using the internet these days. Also, I do wanna say that this video will be available to watch again right here on Earth Echo's YouTube channel. So if you missed anything or you wanna try this activity again, don't worry, you can find it right here. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started with sneak a peek at beaks. So for today, I want to review the materials that you will need. So again, just to review, you will need a few different bowls. And let me go ahead and grab your material list so you can see that here. Great. You will need two bowls filled with water. They don't have to be very big at all. Um, you will need a small cup or a glass. Again, doesn't have to be large. Fill that with water as well. You will also need some red food coloring. You will need a dry cup of dirt or sand. Soil works just fine as well. Um, you'll need some dry beans or even some unpopped popcorn kernels. You will also need some popped popcorn, little tasty snack with our snack size science. You will also need some gummy candies. I like the ones that are shaped like fish the best for this activity. You will need some sprinkles um, or some glitter. You can even have paper glitter handy. You will need a small strainer, something like a tea diffuser or even a small paper cup. And I'll tell you how to create a strainer from that paper cup. You will also need um, a toothpick on hand. Just one will do, but if there are some of you, maybe everybody has their own toothpicks. You will also need a spoon. Doesn't have to be large, a small spoon will work. You will also need a small reusable straw or a coffee stirrer. You will need a set of tweezers and a towel or paper towels on hand just in case because this can get a little bit messy. So what exactly are we going to be doing today? Well, we're going to start by talking about adaptations. And adaptations are a change or the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. An adaptation is essential for the survival of living organisms. So can you think of an example of an adaptation? What might a species do? What might an animal need to do or a plant to be better suited for its environment? Ooh, the adaptation of camouflage. That's a good one. When an animal or maybe even a plant blends in with this environment. That's good. Yes, sure. Different colorations works too. I actually have monarch caterpillars in my garden and their colorations warns others to stay away, right? So some other examples I've thought of are the way that some plants are adapted to live um, in the dry, hot desert, like a cactus or a succulent. Also, bird beaks are another great example of an adaptation in that their beaks are actually designed to help them catch their prey. Now, a bird's beak is a unique and multifunctional tool. It can help a bird to gather or capture its food. It can also help a bird to communicate, to groom its feathers, and do so much more. Now, the shape of a bird's beak is a clue to its main source of food and how it eats because that beak is designed for eating particular types of food. Now, some birds eat seeds, others eat fruit, some eat insects, nectar, fish, or even small mammals. So bird beaks have adapted over time to help different birds find their food within a habitat, which allows them to survive. So what we're going today with our huge list of supplies is we are going to make five different habitats. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a variety of tools to eat and to catch our prey just like a bird. Now hang tight. If you miss that supply list, we're going to put that up again in just a moment. 
but I want to first introduce you to our lineup of our beautiful birds. Now, I live here in Southwest Florida, so I decided to use birds today that I can find right here in Florida habitats and right here in my own backyard. So I wanna show you the five birds that I chose, and we're gonna use our different tools to represent each of these birds. So we're gonna start off right up here with this bird. This is called a white ibis. Now a white ibis has a very thin, tweezer-like beak to search for insects and invertebrates that might be buried in the sand and dirt. So another example of a bird that has an adaptation, a beak like this, would be, say, a woodpecker. And a woodpecker, of course, uses its beak to look for insects that might be hiding in trees. So what tool do you think we'll use today to represent that ibis? Hmm, look at those tools. Ibis have tweezer-like beaks, so that tweezer is going to come in handy. Okay, what about that hummingbird? Who has ever seen a hummingbird before? These are really cool birds. Now, a hummingbird uses a straw-like beak to slurp up nectar from plants and flowers. So of course, we're gonna use that straw or that coffee stir that you have on hand. Okay, what about this bird? This might look strange to some of you who aren't familiar with Florida birds, but I do have to tell you, this is one of my favorite birds to see right here in Florida. I know it's a good day when I see this bird in the wild. This is called a roseate spoonbill. And this bird uses a spoon-like beak to catch invertebrates and small fish that might be at the surface or just under the surface of water. They can even dig down in the dirt. They'll even kick up dirt with their little feet as well to try and stir up some invertebrates and small fish. So what tool will we use to represent that rosé at Spoonbill? You got it, the spoon, of course. Not just a clever name. Okay, here's another one of my favorite Florida birds. We have the heron. Now, a heron is a really cool bird, and what it uses is a spear-like beak to stab its food, to grab onto that food, to help them spear their prey. Now, other birds that you might see in your neck of the woods that have a similar beak are loons, terns, and even bitterns. So what will we use to spear our prey? Well, how about that toothpick? That's a pretty good spear. All right, last but not least, we probably have the most recognizable bird here in Florida, the brown pelican. Now that brown pelican will dive into the water to catch their prey like fish. Now pelican's beaks are adapted to allow them to take a huge gulp of water and then strain it out so that they keep the fish, but that they don't drink that water. So we'll use something that can strain water. Now I happen to have a pretty handy dandy little tea diffuser here that I can use. Now, if you don't have a tea diffuser like this on hand, you can simply use a little paper cup. And you can see here that I've actually used my toothpick to punch holes in my paper cup. So if you have a little paper cup on hand, go ahead and use that toothpick and try and punch some holes. Go ahead and start doing that now so that we have a strainer. But if any of you do have a tea leaf strainer, that works perfect, especially the ones that look like spoons. Those are really helpful as well. Okay, so we're gonna start by setting up our five habitats. But again, I just wanna review with everyone your supply list. So let's take a look at that. So again, what we're gonna need is we're gonna need some bowls filled with water. We will need a small cup filled with water. We will also need some red food coloring. And we will also need a um, small cup of dirt or sand, dry beans, popcorn kernels, popped popcorn, gummy candy, sprinkles or glitter, small strainer or tea diffuser, a toothpick, a spoon, a reusable straw, a tweezers, and some towels. Okay, so we're going to get started by setting up our habitats. 
And so let's start with that bowl or that cup of dirt or sand. So I've got a little, since I live in Florida, I'm fortunate enough to have some beach sand here. So what we're gonna do with this habitat is we're gonna actually take those dried beans or those unpopped popcorn kernels, and we're gonna take these and we're gonna drop these right into that sand. And we're gonna create a little habitat. And these beans and popcorn kernels will represent some small invertebrates. Now you do have a spoon, so go ahead and stir around your invertebrates, mix them up in that habitat, make sure they're hiding in that dirt and sand, get them down as far as you can. All right, and I wanna give a special shout out to one of our resident scientists, Vivi Rose, for tuning in. It's great to see you out there, Vivi Rose. Okay, so what about that small cup of water? So what we're going to do with this now is we are going to take that red food coloring and we're gonna make some flower nectar. So let's go ahead and take that small cup of water and we're gonna drop in, uh-oh, some red food coloring. Oh good, mine is almost out, so I hope you have enough at your home. <laughs> make sure to check your supplies. But of course, you could also use some other food coloring too if red doesn't work. But it should remind you of something. Okay, now let's take a look at that gummy candy. And don't be afraid. If you wanna have a snack, go right ahead. But all we're gonna simply do with our gummy candy is we're gonna drop that gummy candy right on the ground in our habitat. Pretty easy for that habitat setup. Okay, let's take one of our bowls of water. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab our sprinkles and that bowl of water and you are going to just drop those sprinkles right in. Now, some of these sprinkles might float. Some of them might sink to the bottom. You might even notice, in fact, observe those sprinkles as we're waiting to use this habitat because I noticed this yesterday. This habitat does some funny things. So we've got our sprinkles and these will represent a lot of different invertebrates and really small fish in a watery environment. Okay, then we have last but not least, we have our other bowl of water right here. And then we also have some pop popcorn, yummy. So take that popcorn, again, if you need a snack, go right ahead, it is lunchtime here in Florida. So you can drop that popcorn right in there. All right, great. So now our habitats are ready. They are all set up. Is everybody ready to eat lunch? catch some food with our bird beak tools? I hope so, this is gonna be fun. Now, just to review, our Florida birds, we have our ibis with a tweezer-like beak, our hummingbird with a straw-like beak to slurp up nectar. We have our roseate spoonbill who will use its spoonbill beak to help it find small invertebrates and small fish. We have our heron that will use its toothpick spearing-like beak to spear fish. And then last but not least, we have that brown pelican that will gulp up its prey and strain out that water. Now, I will tell you, we have our five birds, we have our five beak tools, we have our five habitats. So guess what? Each habitat will only line up with one bird beak tool. So we need to choose wisely. All right, everyone, you ready to get started? This is gonna be fun. So let's start off with maybe our most tastiest prey today. Let's start off with our gummy candy, our fish that we have lying on the ground. So we have our five tools. We have our strainer. We also have our spoon. <laughs> and we have our tweezer, our toothpick, and our straw. I feel like I'm playing a game of Clue here. So which of these tools will you think we will use to spear our fish? Will we use that spoon? Will we use that strainer? A straw? Will we use the tweezers? The toothpick? Oh, I see the toothpick. So let's test this out. Yep, I think that tool works pretty good. So does anybody remember which of our birds used a spear-like beak to grab onto their prey? Yes, that toothpick matches up with that heron. Great job. Okay, so now let's take a look at that nectar water. 
Okay, so the toothpick should be off the table. It is no longer a choice. Move those gummy candies out of the way. Feel free to have a little snack. Okay, so now we've got our nectar water. Okay, which tool will we use to slurp up this nectar water? Will we use that little spoon we have? Will we use a strainer? Will we use a straw? How about a tweezers? Which tool will we use? Tweezers? Well, can't slurp up any nectar there. Ooh, a straw, you say? All right, let's check it out. And to make this work, go ahead and put your finger on one end of the straw to make it, well, actually, don't do that quite yet. Put your straw in the liquid. Now put your other finger on the top of your straw. See if you get some of that nectar. All right, that definitely looks like a tool you can use. And does anybody remember which bird used the straw to slurp up its food? I hope you said hummingbird because that is the correct answer. It uses its long beak like a straw to slurp up nectar from the flowers. And Vivi Rose, you are two for two, good job. All right, so next let's move to that habitat with our tasty popcorn. Okay, so let me get my nectar out of the way here. All right, habitat, that's our bowl of water with our popcorn. So if you're just catching up, take one of your bowls of water and go ahead and drop some popcorn kernels in it. Now these popcorn are representing some nice tasty fish out there in the ocean. Okay, so what do you think we will use for this? So the tools that we have remaining are a spoon, the tweezers, and a strainer. Any thoughts? How are we gonna get that popcorn of that fish? And here's a little hint. We do not want to drink that salt water where our fish is living. So what are we going to use? Hmm, interesting. Okay, the tweezers just may work, absolutely. But you gotta be pretty precise, right? With that tweezer-like beak to grab onto that popcorn. It's a little bit tough to catch. Ooh, somebody says the strainer. All right, let's check it out with that strainer. Let's see if we can catch some fish. And remember, you can use that cup. Ooh, oh, and the water does strain out. I'm gonna try my little tea diffuser and see how well this works. This should work really well. Ooh. Awesome, it definitely strains that water out a little bit slower than this bird's beak would do. So does anybody remember which bird will strain out the water but keep its prey inside? You have got it, the brown pelican. Okay, everyone, just to review, we only have two birds remaining. We have our roseate spoonbill and we have our white ibis. So which habitat should we experience, experiment with next? Well, let's check out that other one with the water and the sprinkles and let's see what we can do for this one. Okay, so let's change this out and get our other dish of water with the sprinkles. Okay, these sprinkles are little invertebrates that we wanna catch with our beautiful bird beak. So can anybody tell me which of our remaining tools will we use to catch our tiny invertebrates? Will we use our tweezers? Will we use our spoon? Let's see. Now, if we use tweezers, oh, I did get one, but that's kind of hard. Okay, spoon you say, let's check it out. And what this bird would do, ooh, and it's getting rid of the water, very similar to that pelican, but it's not straining it out because what this bird's beak does is they move it back and forth to shake the water out so that they only catch the invertebrates. So does anybody remember which bird this was? You've got it, it's the favorite one I mentioned, the roseate spoonbill, good job, that is excellent. Okay, last 
but certainly not least, we have our very last habitat and we have our last bird too. So can anybody tell me which bird do we have remaining? Process of elimination. We have our beautiful white ibis. These are really cool birds that we like to see here in Florida. Believe it or not, when white ibis are juveniles, when they're kind of teenagers, they're brown. So they're pretty cool. All right, and we have one tool remaining as well. We've got that tweezers. So that ibis will use its tweezer-like beak to dig in the sand, dig in the dirt, and find little invertebrates living there. So anybody ready to go catch some prey? Let's get some lunch with our tweezers. And remember, some other birds that use this same technique and the same type of beak, ooh, not that easy, is it? Woodpeckers have a similar type of beak, tweezer-like, to help them grab onto insects that might, oh, <laughs> the popcorn kernels are kind of hard to catch, that might grab onto some insects. Good job, everyone. So again, that last one was our white ibis. And these are my five favorite Florida birds with all of their beautiful beak adaptations. All right, so let's go ahead. And if anybody has any questions in the chat, go ahead and type those. That was so much fun. Now, can anyone tell me why you think all these different birds have different beaks? Why would they need different beaks from one another? Remember, we talked about how adaptations are a way for them to survive in their environment amongst other species. So why do birds need different beaks? Awesome job. It is for allowing them to survive to eat different foods so that different bird species don't compete for the same resource. Good job. So I do want to check in to see if there are any questions in the chat. Go ahead and type those in right now and we're happy to answer those for you. And remember, you all can re-watch this video. You can try this activity again. You can share it with friends out there. Just simply go to our YouTube channel and this video will be posted as soon as we're finished with our live stream. And also be sure to share it with any friends, family, or teachers that you think might want to learn about bird beak adaptations and might want to have a little tasty snack in the process too. Well, you all can continue to explore other bird adaptations as well as all the birds in your neighborhood. So I challenge everyone to go out. Maybe you go out and you go for a walk in your neighborhood. Maybe you just simply go to your backyard. Why don't you grab a set of binoculars or even just use your beautiful eyes to try and find some birds right there in your own backyard. Observe them, try and identify them. You can even bring a bird checklist out there and even look at those birds and think about what other adaptations might they have to survive in the world that we live in. All right, so I have a question coming in from the chat and the question is, what kind of beaks do owls have? And I'm so glad you asked this. So one beak we didn't talk about are beaks that might belong to birds that we could call raptors. Like you can think of an owl or even an eagle or down here in Florida and all over the place, we have osprey and they like to eat meat. So they're going to have beaks that tear, tear flesh of other animals because those birds are meat eaters. Owls are also in that category. So they're going to have beaks that are really sharp that can tear into the flesh of other animals. Great question. And I love owls. I've got to say, we always try and listen for owls in our neighborhood. And we have little tiny Eastern screech owls that live in our neighborhood. They're like this big and they're so cute. They're so fun. All right, well, everybody out there, I hope you had fun. And believe it or not, you can tune in on Friday, April 10th. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about uh, biodiversity and about adaptations because we will be joined by our scientists, Stacy and Vivi Rose, our resident scientists, I should say. Stacy and Vivi Rose, and they're gonna talk all about backyard biodiversity. And we're gonna have so much fun. Now, be sure to tune in to Earth Echo's YouTube channel 
channel. In fact, while you're here, go ahead and subscribe because you will get alerts when we go live. But you can also go to Earth Echo's website to check out all of the virtual programming that we have lined up this month. We're so excited that you all are enjoying Snack Size Science and that you've joined us today. So you can also go to Earth Echo's website and find some more resources out there. Now you can um, go to www.earthecho.org. And one resource I want to point out to you is called the Our Echo Challenge. It's a STEM competition that empowers students to take a closer look at the species that live in their own community. Now, we want you to look at those species and figure out if there's something that's threatening them. And then you can submit an entry to come up with a solution to help protect preserve, or even repair the resources right there in your own community. Now, the Our Echo Challenge is open for entries. The deadline is April 21st, and you can win up to $10,000 in order to help protect your local community. So join the Our Echo Challenge today. Again, go to www.earthecho.org to learn more. And while you're on our website, if you're enjoying our programs and if you would like to make a contribution and support us, please go ahead and make a donation. We would very much appreciate it. So thank you all so much for stopping by today for some more snack size science. I hope you've had fun and I really hope you've learned a little bit along the way. And us here at Earth Echo, we hope that you and your families are staying healthy, staying safe, but we really want to encourage you to keep exploring. So bye-bye everyone. We hope to see you again soon.